In this video, we're going to build a model to estimate the effect of smoking on FEV or lung capacity. And we're going to be using the FEV data that we've been exploring throughout this set of video. I've already imported the data and attached it. We're going to move through some parts a little bit more quickly, as we've already discussed the concepts of confounding, collinearity effect modification, independent predictors, and so on, and we've explored them specifically for this set of data. A reminder that the concept is as important, if not more important, than the numbers when we're trying to decide if a variable is a confounder or so on. Now in this video, aside from the concepts, we're going to explore if certain variables behave numerically as we would expect, say for a confounder. And a final reminder that things like directed acyclic graphs or DAGs can be used to make decisions about variables to include or exclude. This is a topic not covered in this course, but certainly worth exploring. So let's begin building our model. As we've noted through this course, there's no one right way to build a model. We're going to look at one particular way of doing so. Let's also quickly recall some of the things that we've learned about this data set. The first is that the age variable seems to be a confounder. We've also noted that if we include height, we're likely going to want to include height squared or some other way of fixing the nonlinearity, such as categorizing height. So again, just a reminder of the plot of height versus FEV. Right, we saw the relationship between height and FEV was nonlinear, so we're probably going to need to address that in some way. We've also explored age versus FEV and noted that this looks pretty linear. Let's look at the plot again to remind ourselves. So there's a plot, and let's just add a fitted regression line to that. So again, if we include age, we probably do not need to worry about nonlinearity. And finally, we've seen that there's increasing variability in Y, but we're not going to address this. We've noted that addressing it involves transforming Y in some way. And this complicates the interpretations for an effect size model. We also noted that increasing variability is mainly a problem for predictive models, but we can work with increasing variability in Y and not address it in effect size model and still be okay. We won't spend any time on this in this video, but I wanted to just pay, make a reminder that we should always explore univariate and bivariate summaries before we really get into fitting models. This is going to help us explore the data and understand the patterns a little bit better. So just a few I want to quickly take a look at to make some points. If we look at a box plot of just the ages, we can see the age distribution here looks fairly symmetric, centered around an age of 10. And if we look at a table of ages, we'll actually see that there's not many three-year-olds or not many 19-year-olds in the data set. And if we look at smoking by age, which is going to be an important association to explore, we can actually see here when we look at the smokers, there are no smokers in the age 3 to 8. The youngest smoker is 9. We also see that there's not many smokers who are 17, 18, or 19. Right? There's only two in each of those age groups. Okay, so this really lets us see that the smokers are mainly contained between ages 10 and 16. I'm not going to worry about that when we fit this model here, but I just wanted to point out that through this very quick exploration, we've noted that this is something to consider, that the smokers are not contained at the extreme young or even the older ages. Okay, so let's get to fitting our model. Recall there's lots of ways to approach it. I'm going to use one of them. I'm going to start with a model, calling it model one. And here I'm going to include smoking to estimate FEV, right? That's our main variable of interest. And we're going to start with age in the model as well, because we've identified that age is a pretty strong confounder with the smoking effect. So let's just fit that model. We'll call it model one. We can look at a summary of the model. We see that here. And we're taking notes of the coefficient for smoking negative 0.21 and its standard error of 0.081. Now recall we've talked a bit about when we include other variables that are confounders or collinear variables or, or others, what can happen to the coefficient for our variable of interest, smoking, as well as the standard error. And we said we want to focus more on the concepts of what makes a confounder, but we're also going to look at numerically our variables behaving like a confounder by looking at what happens to the coefficient and the standard error for our variable of interest. So just as a reminder to that, let's look at what happens if we have the model without age. So I'll fit that model, I'll call it model zero. Let's ask for a summary of the model. And we can see the smoking coefficient would be positive 0.71. Right? When we adjust for age, it goes down all the way to negative 0.21. So a huge change in that coefficient, which is what we'd expect to see for a confounder. And we also see the standard error for the smoking coefficient 0.11. Right, or 0 0.10994, and when we include age, it drops down to 0.08. So again, these are things we said numerically confounders behave like this. 
the estimate of the coefficient for our variable of interest will change when we adjust for that confounder. And the standard error usually tends to stay the same or decrease a bit. It might increase a little bit as well, but there's not a, a huge inflation in that standard error. Right, a big inflation or big increase in the standard error is indicative of collinearity. So that was just a quick reminder for ourselves. Let's consider adjusting for the height variable. And recall that we're probably going to want to include height squared as well. Right? When we initially explored the data, we saw the relationship between height and FEV appeared to be nonlinear. So if we include height, we're probably going to want to include height squared as well. First, let's fit a model with just height. Let's look at a plot of the diagnostic plot to check the assumptions of this model. Again, here we can see the curved pattern in that residual plot indicating nonlinearity, which we've already noted through our initial data exploration. We could see that nonlinearity that we identified earlier. Now let's include height squared as well. I'll call that model three. And let's check the model assumptions for model three. When looking at the residual plot, now we see the red smoother through the residuals. It's pretty much flat around zero, indicating linearity assumption is met. Okay, so this has fixed the issue. Just a quick reminder that we can do other things to address the nonlinearity, such as try transforming height, maybe working with log height or categorizing height. Previously through our exploration, we thought height squared seemed like a reasonable option, so we're going to go with that. And since we're not going to interpret the height coefficient, we're not concerned with any loss of interpretability by using height and height squared in the model. But just a note, you might choose to adjust for categorized height instead, and that would be a perfectly reasonable approach. And if you wanted to try that out, I have the code here to create the categorized height variable, so you can try doing that and including that in the model instead if you prefer. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare these two models using the partial f test to confirm that the model that includes height squared is better fit than the model that includes just height. This isn't completely necessary to do, as we've already identified that including height squared addressed the nonlinearity issue. But let's just look at that anyways. So this is comparing the model that has height squared to a model that doesn't. And again there, we can see where it shows model one and model two, the models we're comparing. So we're testing if adding height squared significantly improves the model. We can see the RSS, the residual sum of squares, or the sum of squared error, drops from 114 down to 102 when we include height squared. And this is a statistically significant improvement in the model. The model with height squared is a significantly, statistically significantly better fit. Okay, and again, to get an idea of if we think height is a confounder, we can look at the conceptual diagram to see if it makes sense as a confounder, right, if height would be related to smoking and if height is related to FEV. Let's look numerically here and compare the coefficient and its standard error of smoking in model one and model three, the model that does not have height and the model that has height and height squared. So just a reminder here, the model with just smoking in age, the smoking coefficient was negative 0.21, standard error of 0.08. Model three, when we adjust for height and height squared, let's look at a summary of that. Here we can see the smoking coefficient changes, goes down to negative 0.15, and the standard error also decreases down to 0.057. Okay, so again, numerically, height seems to be behaving like a confounder. I think that we should adjust for the height here, including height squared as well. And just a quick note that while the age and the height are related, they're not measuring the exact same thing. They don't seem to be collinear. Knowing a kid's age doesn't necessarily tell you what their height is. Right? They're not that strongly associated. Letting our model know both the age and the height of the child helps to better measure the body size, which is what we really want to adjust for. So we're going to go ahead with including height and height squared in the model. Now let's consider including biological sex in the model. Again, you can think about conceptually if sex fits the criteria to be a confounder. I'm going to go ahead and fit a model, calling it model four, that now adds biological sex to the model. We fit that model, let's look at the summary. We can see when we adjust for biological sex, the smoking coefficient is negative 0.13 and a standard error of 0.057. And if you remember when we did not adjust for biological sex, the smoking coefficient was roughly negative 0.15. Okay, so it wasn't a, a big difference in value when we adjust for sex. But I'm going to choose to keep it in the model for a few reasons. The first is that I think uh, it is reasonable to adjust for it. Biological sex is going to be related to FEV. Males on average have bigger bodies than females, so it is going to be an important predictor. We can check statistically if that's true, but it's going to be an important predictor conceptually of FEV. Also for face validity, because we know conceptually that biological sex should be related to lung capacity, we should want to include it in the model 
even if numerically it doesn't make much difference when we adjust for it or not. I'll also point out that we can see that there is an association between smoking and biological sex. So if we look at a mosaic plot, we can see it deviates a bit from the cross pattern that we'd expect for independence. We can see for females, there's a slightly higher proportion of smokers than males. We can calculate the proportion of smokers for females and males and compare those. I'm going to do that here. First for females, we can see that 12.2% of females in this data set are smokers. If we calculate that for males, 7.73% of males are smokers. Okay, so again, there is some association between biological sex and smoking, females being more likely to smoke in this data set. So we have a few arguments for including biological sex in our model. Now we've made most of the decisions about which variables to include. Before we move on, I just want to, for the sake of completeness, explore adding age squared to the model as well. So seeing do we need to include a nonlinear term for age. To do so, I'm going to fit model, I'm going to call it 4.1, which is the same as model 4, except it also includes age squared in the model. So I'm going to fit that model here. And then I'm going to do the partial F test, compare model 4 and model 4.1. Again, that's comparing the model that included age squared to the model that didn't. We can see the change in the residual sum of squares, or what we're calling the sum of squared error, is pretty trivial. It goes from 101.15 down to 100.99. And we can see, looking at the p-value, it is not a statistically significant change. So age squared does not improve the model statistically. And we kind of already knew that, that we didn't really need to address a nonlinearity in age, that age appeared to be linear. So now that we've decided which variables to include in the model, we're going to explore some effect modification terms. We saw through earlier exploration that we might want to consider including a smoking by age interaction or effect modification. Even though we thought it didn't really make sense conceptually that the effect of smoking should change with age, numerically it appeared like it might be there, so let's just explore that. First, I'm going to fit model 4. We've already fit that. I'm just going to fit it again here so we can see it. This is a model that estimates the smoking effect on FED, adjusting for age, height, height squared, and biological sex. So I'm going to fit that model. And then I'm going to fit a model called model 5, where I also include the smoking by age interaction or effect modification. Now, we're going to use the partial F test to test if this effect modification or interaction term is statistically significant. Let's do that here. We can see, comparing the two models, the change in the residual sum of squares, or sum of squared error, is pretty trivial. The p-value is not statistically significant. So this interaction or effect modification term is not statistically significant. And we also noted that, conceptually, it didn't really make sense that the smoking effect should change or depend on the age. If this was a significant interaction, it was likely due to the age being a combination of measuring the age as well as the length of time smoking. Right, the kids who are older likely smoked for longer than the kids who are younger. And just for the sake of exploring, let's test the interaction or effect modification between sex and smoking. So this would suggest that the effect of smoking is different for males or females. That's probably not true, but there might be some biological mechanism behind this that we don't know or don't understand. So let's just explore it, also for the exercise of going through and testing another effect modification term. So I'm going to refit model 4 again. Again, we don't need to do this. We've already fit it. I just want it on the screen so we can see the models we're comparing. And then I'm going to fit a model called Model 6 that also includes the smoking by sex interaction or effect modification term. And I'm going to compare those using the partial F test, right, testing if that smoke by sex interaction term is statistically significant. Again, we can see the change in the residual sum of squares, or what we're calling the sum of squared error. It's pretty small. The p-value is not statistically significant. This interaction or effect modification term is not statistically significant, and also we didn't think it was very plausible conceptually. Now just a quick reminder that we really want to stick to only checking interaction or effect modification terms that make sense biologically. The more tests that we do, the more chance we have of making a false positive or a type 1 error. Right? The more we dig around, eventually something's going to pop up as significant. So we really only want to test the ones that we think make sense or we hypothesize could make sense. Now, We've already checked the assumptions for this model, but since we've reached what we're going to call a final model, let's check the assumptions for that model, and then we'll get to interpreting it. So just quickly checking those diagnostic plots. We can see looking at the residual plot, the linearity assumptions met, so we don't need to worry about that. We still see increasing variability, and it makes sense that we see this. We have not done anything to 
address variability in y, right? We've not transformed y in any way. And we've said that we don't really need to. Since we want to estimate the effect of smoking on FEV, we don't need to worry too much if there's increasing variability. Let's move into interpreting the model coefficients. And I guess before we do that, just a quick note that if you wanted to fit a model that uses the log FEV, right, the log of y, here's the code to do that. And I also want to note in the code I put there, if you decided to do that, you'd probably get rid of the height squared term, right? By taking the log of FEV, we saw in earlier videos that this addressed the nonlinearity as well. This complicated the interpretations of the smoking effect, right? This model's coefficients will tell us what effect does smoking have on log lung capacity. So it's not really great if our goal is to interpret the smoking effect, but you can take a look at fitting this model if you want. And if you ask for a summary of the model, you see here's the model coefficients. And just a reminder, this smoking coefficient here tells us for someone who smokes, we'd expect their log lung capacity to be 0.046 log liters lower than the non-smoke, right? So it doesn't really have a good interpretation. But if our goal was just to predict someone's lung capacity, working with this model would probably be the better choice. So now let's get back to model four, right? The model that we were working with to estimate the effect of smoking on FEV. Here's just a summary of that model. This was the final model we decided on. That's the estimated effect of smoking. A quick reminder, you can ask for just the coefficients from the model this way. You can ask for a confidence interval around those coefficients. And just for the sake of neatness, this is not necessary, but for on the screen, it makes it a little bit neater to look at. We can bind all those together. So I'm gonna to bind together in a column-wise fashion the coefficients and their confidence interval. So that's here, showing each of the coefficients along with their 95% confidence intervals. And this last piece of code I'm gonna do just rounds those to three decimal places to make it a little bit neater to look at. So let's look at that here. Now we can see the effect of smoking, right? Interpreting that coefficient. For someone who smokes, we'd expect the average lung capacity to be 0.13 liters lower than someone who doesn't smoke, adjusting for age, biological sex, and height. We're 95% confident that the mean FEV for the smoker is gonna be somewhere between 0.245 liters lower to 0.02 liters lower than a non-smoker. Okay, so this is statistically significant, right? It does not contain the value of zero. Deciding whether or not that's a clinically or scientifically significant effect that's subjective and left to you. A decrease of a quarter of a liter, to me that seems like it's probably a, a big or meaningful effect. A decrease of 0.02 liters, I think that's probably not very clinically meaningful. But again, this is left for interpretation. That's not a statistical question. If you looked at the R squared for the model, you'd find that it's 79.4%, right? So again, this model explains 79.4% of variability in the FEV or lung capacity. I just want to finish up with a reminder, as you always want to comment on the limitations of the data. So for example, smoking was self-reported. Right? We're asking kids, do you smoke, yes or no? They may be saying they do, or maybe saying they don't for certain reasons, right? We may not be getting accurate data. We've only identified, do you smoke, yes or no? Nothing about the duration. Right? So nothing about how much or how long. So there's quality, there's data quality issues you definitely want to address in a write-up about this. Now we're going to leave the exercise there. And on your own, if you want, you can explore some of the other side topics that were mentioned in this video.